Coming up next on Contemplate. That's why Eve says to Adam, oops, I ate the fruit, you want some too? That's why when you were younger, or maybe even now, and you do something you know you shouldn't do, sometimes you get your friends and you say, come and do this also. You know it's wrong, but somehow it feels like maybe misery loves company or there's safety in numbers. We've now convinced ourselves as a society that if we can get enough people to vote to make something legal, that will make it right. In our last episode, we began the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who sold some land but weren't truthful about what they did with the money. And when confronted about it by Paul, Ananias died right on the spot. We'll continue in Acts chapter 5, verse 6. Here's Pastor David. Let's go on to verse 6. It says, And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. So in Israel, this type of burial would have actually been common. It wasn't like, you know, they're just getting rid of the body real quick because of some, you know, reason that Ananias was a particularly bad guy or something like that. They buried him so quickly because that's the way that they bury people. Even today in Israel, you bury people for a couple of reasons within the day that they die. One of the reasons is tradition. Um, And there's some scriptural stuff behind that, that you don't let the sun go down. You don't let night happen between the time somebody dies and the time you bury him. The the practical reason is that in Israel, because of the climate and so on, a body decomposes very quickly. And they don't embalm their dead or do anything like that. So it's very normal for them to take somebody who died and pretty much immediately bury him, which is what they did here. They buried him quickly. So let's look at verse 7 and 8. It says, now it was about three hours later when his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Now, I have no idea how his wife, Sapphira, did not hear about what had happened. Uh, My guess is there was some chatter going on around about the fact that this guy came in light of the Holy Spirit and died. Yet somehow she comes in three hours later and doesn't know. And it says, Peter answered her, and the the word used there suggests that there had been a question asked. Probably something like, where's Ananias? He didn't come home for supper, right? She comes in, she wants to know where her husband is. It's three hours later, she was expecting to be home. Maybe she she was hoping she was going to come and find that he was just having this party where everybody was honoring him for being such a great guy and giving all the money from the sale of land. That, That was in their heart, right? They wanted to be honored and praised for being so generous with their money. So maybe that's what she was hoping for when she came. But what she asked was, where, where is he? Where is he? Where is he at? And then Peter answers her with a question. Did you sell this thing for so much? And when he says so much, it's very possible that the money that Ananias had laid at his feet was still sitting right there. Did you sell it for so much, this money that's sitting right here? Is this what you got for the land? Now she's got a choice to make, right? She's in this position where she's got to be at least a little leery of why he's asking this question. Certainly Ananias had come and already told them that he sold it for so much. I mean, the money's sitting right there. It's kind of like when your parents ask you, so what happened last night at the whatever? And you know they're fishing, right? They know something funky happened, right? And they're trying to catch you in a lie. And so you got a couple of choices. You can, I mean, you're going through this whole thing. I can tell them right now and, you know, just kind of take it. Or I can see kind of what they know and try to do it. Or I can just stay strong on this lie and see whether they've got the proof. I had clients, you know, like that when I practiced law, uh, you know, who were kind of that way. Well, I may have done it, I may not have done it, but do they have any proof? Can they prove it? And so they sort of keep the lie up, right, until someone can actually prove them wrong. So this is where Sapphira is at, and she decides she's going to stay with the program. Her and Ananias had decided that they were going to do this, and she's going to stick with it. So she says, yeah, yeah, that's what we sold it for. That's what we sold it for. Now, 5-9. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Okay. Peter asked this question, how is it? How is it that you and your husband have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? And this is a legitimate question by Peter. And here's why it's justified that he would be so confused. You have to put yourself in the context of what's going on at this time. What does the church know about the Holy Spirit and about God? 
We have miracles happening, people speaking in languages that they don't know, lame people getting healed, houses shaking, right? You have all these things going on. They know that God is there and in power in the church. And they know that the Holy Spirit is God, the God of the universe that created everything. And Peter is asking himself, when you know this about God, how can you possibly put him to the test? How can you put him to the test when you know how powerful he is? How did you allow yourself to become so deceived that you would think you could pull one over on God? Like her and Ananias are sitting there saying, well, he is the God of the universe. He did create everything. But maybe if I put the money in my pocket, he won't look there. Right? Like there's some way that you're going to actually be able to hide from God what you're doing. And the only way that this can happen is allowing yourself to become deceived which is what has happened here. And the Ananias and Sapphira have gotten caught up. They saw Barnabas. He gives all his money. He probably got a lot of praise, a lot of honor from the people. And this is what they want for themselves. So they want their honor, but they want it at at least a slight discount. Instead of giving everything, they want to give part of it and say they gave everything. That's not going to work. Because like we said, they're lying to the Holy Spirit. and and, And Peter's confused about how they could become so deceived. But that happens all the time. Happens all the time, happens to all of us. As our evil desires come and we start to justify what we're doing and we allow ourselves to become more and more deceived until we can convince ourselves to do this thing that we really want to do. And also what we see here is that they agreed together. They conspired with one another, conspiring against God. We we recently read the passage where it talks about how the, the kings of the earth and the rulers of the people, they get together and they conspire against the Lord, saying, let's break off these chains, right? They don't want to be under God's rule anymore. And they figure if they can get together enough people, maybe there's safety in numbers, right? That's why Eve says to Adam, well, oops, I ate the fruit. You want some too? That's why when you were younger or maybe even now and you do something you know you shouldn't do, sometimes you get your friends and you say, come and do this also. You know it's wrong, but somehow it feels like maybe misery loves company or there's safety in numbers. We've now convinced ourselves as a society that if we can get enough people to vote to make something legal, that will make it right. It's a conspiracy to sin, right? It's always better when we have safety in numbers, but here's the thing. When Ananias and Sapphira came before Peter... And frankly, before the Holy Spirit through Peter, they weren't together. They had to face him alone. So their conspirator, the one that made them feel like they could maybe, you know, maybe they could get away with it, wasn't there with them. And that's the way it's going to be. You may, you may sin with all of your friends, but when it comes down to the end, you're going to face God by yourself. And you're not going to be able to say, oh, my wife made me do it, or my husband made me do it, or my friends made me do it. The devil made me do it. You're going to be responsible for what you did by yourself. There is no safety in numbers when it comes to sin, yet somehow we seem to convince ourselves that there is. And it seems that that's what Ananias and Sapphira have gotten into here. They think there's somehow safety in numbers. And then we have these young guys that... uh, Here, let's go to verse 10. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So we have these young guys, these poor guys. They've just come. They had to take a dead body, carry it out somewhere, bury it. It's taken at least three hours, we know, because it was three hours later that she came. They finally get back. It's been three hours. They're coming back. They're hoping Peter's maybe going to give them a high five and some Gatorade. But instead, (laughs) they walk in, and there's another dead body sitting there. And he's like, hey, guys, hook this one up, too. So Peter and the apostle makes me feel a little bit better because sometimes I make the young guys do a lot of work, right? And so Hunter and, and Patrick and you guys, it's biblical, okay? <laughs> it's biblical. The apostles have been doing it forever. You got to make the young guys work. I mean, keep them busy, keeps them out of trouble, right? Keep them. But the point is, is that these young guys, these poor young guys are having to bury bodies. But she dies too. She dies too. Now, she wasn't even the one who had conceived it to keep this money back. But when her husband conceived it, she agreed with him. She conspired with him to do it. She could have told him, no, don't be an idiot. You can't lie to the Holy Spirit. You can't fool the Lord. This is a dumb thing for you to do. But she didn't do that, as far as we know, right? And then she comes before the apostles, and they ask her, and it's clear what's going on. And yet she still lies when she had the ability to confess and make things right. And as a result, she dies. She dies. So, last verse in the passage that we're going to read for today says, So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. 
You think? Right? Two people come in. They lie to the Holy Spirit, which, remember, from a lot of people's perspective, it's like, okay, these people gave a lot of money. They just didn't give everything, and they died for that. That seems like a pretty high standard. Seems like a pretty high standard. Of course, that's not what they died for. They didn't die because of that. They died because of the lie. So what are we going to get from this passage? What are we, what are we going to see from this passage? First, this last verse where it says that the church feared and the people outside who heard about it feared. It's an interesting thing because there's a sign that's clearly happened not just to the church, but to everybody, that Christianity is legit. That there's some serious, they're already seeing, they're seeing miracles, they're seeing things, and then these people die. And people are afraid and they recognize what's going on with these Christians is something very, very serious. So we see that happening. But let's deal, first of all, with what we often deal with in these Acts passages, the prescriptive, descriptive issue. For those of you who haven't been here before, Acts is a history and it tells us a lot of stuff that happens and some of it is simply descriptive. It's saying, this is what happened. Okay, that's all it's telling you. It's just telling you that. And then there's some of it that says, this is what happened, but it's prescriptive. It's saying, and you should do this also. So about this passage, about these two folks dying because they lied to the Holy Spirit because they were hypocrites, essentially, is this prescriptive or descriptive? Well, let's say this. There's not another point in the New Testament where we see this exact thing happen. We actually do see some other people die for sin, for certain kinds of sin that they commit. And we see some other people die in the New Testament. So it's not that it's impossible, but we don't, but there's been a lot of hypocrites since then, and not all of them have dropped dead as soon as they've been hypocrites, right? And so I'm assuming, I mean, me, myself included. And so I'm assuming that this is not what we'd call a normative part of the Christian life, that as soon as you're a hypocrite, you die. Although, let me be honest with you, I wouldn't test it. You know, I wouldn't test it. But it's not what we see as, as maybe the normal operation of the way things happen. But this was a very specific time and a very specific instance. And so we got to think about why might God have done this in this instance or allow this to happen in this instance. A lot of people, or, or there's several people who, when they look at this passage, they liken it to another passage that's in the Old Testament about a guy named Achan. Now, Achan was a guy, he was an Israelite. And the Israelites had just come in. They had, they had left Egypt. They had wandered for 40 years in the desert. And God was now bringing them in to the land of Israel under the leadership of Joshua. And he was going to have them go in and basically clear the land. And they go to a place called Jericho. And Jericho is a city with these big walls. And Joshua leads them. And they basically, they march around the walls. They blow these trumpets. And these walls, these huge thick walls, they come down. God basically makes the whole city fall down and they go in and they do a lot of killing and, and they basically purge this place, okay? But God had said, do not take any of the spoil, any of the stuff from Jericho. In this city, we're going to consecrate all this stuff to the Lord. But Achan, when he saw some of the stuff, said, this is some pretty good stuff. And so he took some and he hid it. Like Ananias and Sapphira, for some reason he thought that God that created the universe and just made the walls of the city fall down wouldn't be able to find the stuff as long as he hid it under the towels in his tent. Um, and so that's what he did, and nobody knew about it except for God. And the next thing they do is that Joshua sends 3,000 men to a city called Ai to defeat it, and it should have been an easy thing to do. But instead they get turned back, and they have to run from the city of Ai. And 36 men die, and God tells Joshua, you've got sin in the camp. Someone's stolen some stuff. Someone's taken some stuff that was supposed to be consecrated to the Lord. So anyway, they question him. They find out that it's Achan. He admits that he took this stuff. They throw rocks at him, kill him, burn him, bury him under some rocks. It's, it's pretty rough. But what you see is, at the beginning, as Israel is now coming into the land, and God is, is doing this thing for Israel, and, and they're his people, and he's setting them up in their land right from the gate, right out of the gate, at the beginning. He's saying, we cannot have sin in the camp. We cannot have sin within our people. And so right out of the gate, we have Achan who sinned. Certainly, there was all kinds of sin that happened after that, and God did not punish it all the same way. But this one he does. And again, we see here right at the beginning of the church, right out of the gate. Let's not forget that the church, everything started out really well. And the Holy Spirit's just in power. And people are, you know, the people of God, the people who are following Christ have favor with the people. And it's this really good thing. But then persecution comes from the outside. 
That was that story before with Peter and John where they put him in jail. And they had to let him go. We start to see that persecution is beginning from the outside. Now in this story, we see that we have trouble coming from the inside. So Satan is attacking the church on both sides. And what God is saying is, listen, I am a good God. But don't let yourself believe that because I'm good and because I'm powerful and I'm doing all these things for you, that you can be unholy. That you can do things that dishonor the people around you and dishonor me. That's what happens with Achan. Hey, God's coming in. Everything's going great. They're destroying Jericho and whatever. And Achan thinks, oh, God will let this one go. And Ananias and Sapphira are the same thing. They think, hey, God's doing this great thing. Look at what the Holy Spirit's doing. This is all great. And God reminds his people and shows a sign that, no, no, I am holy. And I will not allow you to destroy my people from the inside out. God's very serious about that. He's very serious about hypocrisy, right? We see Jesus, and he goes, and the leaders of Israel, they're hypocrites. They have an attitude very much like Ananias and Sapphira. They want to pretend like they're very, very generous folks, so they make a big show when they give money, so that everyone will look up to them and say, oh, look at them, they're so generous, they're so nice. And that's what they're looking for, is the praise of the people. And Jesus calls them out on it. And if you read the things that Jesus says, he says pretty rough things to these people. He's very upset about their hypocrisy, and he is not going to allow the same thing to happen in his church. So when Ananias and Sapphira lie and become hypocrites, they're dealt with quite swiftly. Quite swiftly, right? Um, And so here's the thing. Christians have sometimes gained a reputation as being hypocrites. We can't be hypocrites. We can't be hypocrites. We cannot deny the power of Christ by saying one thing and doing something else. The last time that we studied, we talked about how Jesus said that I want, I want them to be one. He was praying for the church, the people that would believe in him. I want them to be one, Father, as we are one. And because if they're one, people from the outside will look in and believe that Jesus was Son of God and will believe in the love of God for his people. We, we, Jesus said that specifically. And so I asked, so if that's what happens when we are one, what happens when we're not one? And this time I want you to think about what happens if we're hypocrites? What happens? How do, what do people think about Jesus? What do the people think about the church when you're a hypocrite? When I'm a hypocrite, how does that affect the church? Because if you lie about one thing, why would anybody trust you about anything else? If you're two-faced, if you're a liar, if you tell lies, people don't trust you about anything, right? There's a, a guy who was speeding, speeding really fast, and he got pulled over, and the officer comes to the car, and he says to the guy, hey, can I see your driver's license? And the guy says, hey, I, I don't have it. It got suspended when I got my fifth DUI. And so the officer's a little concerned about that. He says, can I see the registration for your vehicle? And the guy says, no, no, I, it's not my car. I stole this car. I don't, I don't have a registration. And he says, the officer says, so the car is stolen? Yeah, yeah, it's stolen. Um, he said, but you know what? I do think I saw the registration in the glove box when I put my gun in there. And the officer says, you got a gun in the glove box? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I used to kill the woman who owned the car. And, and, and put her in the trunk. And he said, and you've got a body in the trunk? And the guy says, yeah. So the officer runs back to his car. He calls the captain of the police force and all the police cars come and they surround this car. They pull their guns out and the captain comes up, you know, gun drawn, to talk to the guy and he says, sir, can I, can I see your license? And the guy says, oh yeah, here you go. Hands in the license and the guy looks, it's valid, valid license. He says, well, can I see your registration? He goes, oh yeah, here, here it is. Looks at the registration. The guy owns the car. Totally fine. So the police captain says, well, can I see what's in your glove box? I was told there was a gun in your glove box. He's like, oh, yeah, you can see. There's no gun in here. He opens the glove box. No gun. He says, well, can you open up the trunk? Because I was told that there's a body in the trunk. And he opens up the trunk, and he looks in there, and he says, nothing. There's nothing in there. So I says, I don't understand this. this. This officer that pulled you over, he told me, that you had no license, that you had no registration, that you stole the car, that you had a gun, and that there was a body in the trunk. And the guy looks at the police captain and he says, yeah, that liar probably told you I was speeding too. <laughs> you see what I mean? You can't believe somebody. They lie about one thing, they're going to lie about other things, right? 
Now, here's the deal. As Christians, we're held to a higher standard. People hold you to a higher standard when you say you're a follower of Christ, and they should. Because you are saying, I follow the God of the universe. I follow Jesus Christ. I'm trying to live my life in a way that honors him. So when you go on Facebook and post, uh, you know, share a verse about love and forgiveness and whatever, and the next day you put a rant on there in angry words and colorful language about so-and-so that you're mad at, they rightfully think you might be a hypocrite. Right? When we act one way but say something different... We don't honor God, and we damage the church. We damage the church. And so our call as people is to recognize the holiness of God and recognize that hypocrisy and deception has no place, no place in the life of a Christian. Ananias and Sapphira, they were dealt with pretty seriously, so that God could show us how serious he was about it. But just because he's given you some grace and not made you drop dead, that hasn't happened. Don't mistake that. Don't mistake that for a lack of holiness on God's part. Just because he's been patient, just because he's been patient with us, does not mean that he's okay with it. And I can tell you this. Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And the problem is, is that that is so common for all of us, right? We claim to have this standard. We live apart from it. So I'm not asking you to be perfect, by the way. I don't expect you to be. God is working in you if you're a follower of Christ to make you perfect. But what I'm asking you to do is be honest, Don't pretend to be one thing and then do something different. I'm asking you to push in the direction of holiness to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Because when the Holy Spirit's guiding you, Satan sure isn't guiding you. When the Holy Spirit's guiding you, you're going to do those things that are right. Then you don't have to worry about hypocrisy at all. But when you are a hypocrite and when you lie, when you're dishonest, you damage you damage relationships, friendships, your marriage, your career, and your relationship with God. Because dishonesty is damaging. And so all I'm really asking us to do is that if we want people to believe in Jesus, if you want to be an example of Christ, that people believe in Jesus, then be honest and trustworthy and don't be hypocritical and two-faced. Be real about who you are. Be real about who God is making you. And don't try to get the praise of people. That's what, that's what Ananias and Sapphira wanted, right? They were looking to give money to get praise from people. But that's the last thing you should be giving money for. You're giving money to, to the church for God, for your relationship with God. You want praise from him. Ultimately, you want him to say to you someday, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the praise you're looking for. Because I can praise you all day long and it will not get you into heaven. And it will not make God happy with you because you got my praise or someone sitting around you. The praise from them. Don't be going after that. When you go after that, it causes you to come into all kinds of trouble. And it causes this kind of hypocrisy. But if the only person you're worried about is God and what he thinks of you, and you understand that he loves you, and you seek him, you're not going to ever run into these kinds of problems. So all I'm asking is that as a church, that we be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we desire not the praise of people, but the praise of God. And that we live in such a way that other people want to know who Jesus Christ is. Want to know why we live the way that we do. Want to know why we're not hypocritical. Why we are honest. Why we are trustworthy. And are drawn in rather than repelled. As it says in Colossians, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We really do represent God in everything we do, for better or worse. Let's live our lives in such a way that people can see how great God really is. And if there's some areas in your life that could use a little work, come see us here at Axe Church in Vancouver, Washington this Sunday. We'd love to help you get back on track, living flat out for Jesus. Get easy directions and all the info you need at axchurchnw.org or call 360-885-9000.
Hope you enjoyed today's lesson and be sure and check out the next episode for more with Pastor David Robinson here on Contemplate.